when I first kind of started swinging flies, it was by accident. I basically tied a sculpin. I was fishing for smallmouth. I caught a steelhead on a big sculpin pattern, and I came up with a fly called uh, Emulator, which was kind of one of my first. That was definitely your foundation fly. Foundation fly, and uh, you know, I still have that fly in my box, but it uh, needed an update, and so uh, I started tying, fooling around with some of the same materials and just changing some things to synthetic, and uh, this fly kind of emerged. It's a good fly to swing. It certainly works as a stripped fly as well. Um, I was running out of names. Somebody asked me what to call it, and I said I was tying these code breaker flies, and I thought, well, it's bigger. We'll call it a toad breaker. So, <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, I like it. <laughs> It's uh, that's where we're at with this one. So I like it. Yeah. So I'm going to show you guys how to do it. It's actually a pretty simple fly, but it, and it's a chunky fly. I used synthetic materials for the head so that it would be a little bit easier to cast than my old emulator, which had a big Australian possum head, which is still a great way to do it. But the synthetic sinks a little bit better, and it, it casts a little bit easier. So, um, so that's what we're going to do with that. So. Um, this is going to be tied on a shank. It's a 55 millimeter shank, which is a pretty long shank. Uh, it's about as long as you can typically find it at most places. And anybody that's seen me tie before knows that I tend to use braided loops. Some of the newer braid that I found is really stiff, which works well for this because it doesn't foul. Um, for a lot of these bigger flies, I use 80 pound braid because I'm going to use a pretty big trailing hook. Um, and uh, if I if I tie smaller flies or if I try to tie flies that I want the trout to be able to eat so I can run a smaller hook, uh, I'll use 60 pounds. So, and uh, the color is your choice. You know, the, the 80 pound I'm using is green and ideally I'd probably use red because it's a little easier to see if you tie an olive fly, you know, and pick it out. But, uh, but uh, I'm going to show you guys how I prep for a fly like this first. And um, you know, if you've seen me didn't do this before, bear with me. But... I'm just going to take a piece of this braid, okay? If you're using big scissors uh, or really good scissors, you want to use the back of your scissors because that will wear out a scissors about as quickly as anything. And this piece of braid, probably about 8 inches long or so, and I'm going to fold it in half like that, okay? See how I've got a loop? And then I'm just going to take my finger and I'm going to make an overhand knot, okay? Just like that, okay? And now, I'm just going to take this for just a minute, I'm going to set it aside, and I'm going to come back to it in just a moment. But I'm going to set it aside, and I'm going to take my thread. Uh, you want to use some heavy-duty thread, the color's not so important. Um, you know, I don't typically worry too much about color. But if you only have one color to choose from, a lighter color is nice. You can always take a sharpie or another permanent marker and uh, mark it up with whatever color you want if you use a light enough color but i'm using yellow and uh, all i'm going to do the foundation to any good fly is to cover the hook with or the shank with thread in this case okay and i'm going to bring this up to the front third of the hook and i'll leave a gap at the front that's where the massive head of a sculpin is going to be sculpins tend to be kind of if you think about them, they're kind of a teardrop shape from head to tail. They don't have any scales, so fish really like to eat them. Um, they're pretty much any of our rivers that have rocks, have sculpins, uh, especially if there's good water quality in those rivers. So, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to tie this here sculpin. I'm going to I'm going to place a pair of bead chain eyes. In this case, they're copper. There's just two of them there, and I'm going to tie them underneath the hook underneath this shank. Uh, you, you probably could, as this fly looks pretty similar from the top and from the bottom, you could certainly tie it in either way, but I tend to put them on the bottom of the hook just out of habit because a lot of flies I do try to t tip over so that the hook rides up. So, so now that we've covered this first part, I am going to take a this loop that we just made and uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take that loop and I'm going to put it right through the eye of the hook from underneath. All right, like so. You guys can kind of see I've got the loop and I'm going to try to extend it so that that loop is just big enough 
so that there's about a hook's worth behind the loop. And the reason I do that is when I put, finally put this hook on the end, it has to have enough room so that I can loop to loop that hook. And it'll make sense to you, especially if you've ever made one where you made the loop too small and you only had hooks that were too big. <laughs> right. I've done that. <laughs> which is, which you can kind of, at least you can go and buy some bigger hook or s smaller hooks, but uh, what's even worse is if you tie this fly and you forget to put the loop on it completely. <laughs> How often do you do you find yourself actually changing a hook out? I mean, is it? It's not really common, um, although I do, what I do find more often than not and where it really comes to play for me is that I um, will recycle the hooks. So I'll actually, when the fly deteriorates, I'll pull the hook off and I'll use it for another fly provided that it's still sharp. That's a good yeah. idea. I mean, yeah. that's a good idea. I find myself yeah. like, man, I'm, fly's falling apart. I never changed the hook on this. Yep. I like having the, you know, having it swinging free. It's so good for fighting fish. I mean, yep. it's not good for hooking wood, but <laughs> as we all yeah, know. Yeah, and I mean, the, the, I mean, one of the other advantages that you have is that you can, if you do mess up the hook on a fly, you can come back and, and put a new hook on it too. So that's another benefit. But for me, and, and, and there's been, you know, it's not always easy to obtain bulk hooks these days. So no, sometimes... It's, Sometimes difficult. recycling hooks is as much of a necessity as it is a yeah, is a luxury. So what hook are you uh, using so, these days? So for this fly, for the bigger flies, I use a Daiichi tube fly hook, size four. This is kind of my bread and butter hook on the Muskegon, and it works like a charm on the Muskegon. It's a size four Daiichi twenty four fifty. Now this hook isn't perfect for every place. If you fish a river that has really low flows, then it's probably going to sag a little bit. So you kind of have to pick something specific for your river, but for these bigger flies, this is what I use. Um, when we're uh, when I'm trying to fish for for uh, use flies that are good for trout and for steelhead, I might go with a little smaller pattern or a smaller smaller hook like this octopus hook, which this one's also a Daiichi, but there's good octopus hooks made by a lot of different brands. Sure, uh, but. Uh, the only downside to that is if I'm using this pretty heavy uh, stuff, I really have a hard time. It's a struggle getting that 80-pound through, so I would use the lighter braid for that. So, so anyways, I'm going to just uh, I'm going to take my thread, and right over the eyes, I'm going to form an X with it. And I'm going to cover the shank going back. And then I'm going to bring the uh, thread back up to the front. Now... It's not the most aesthetically appealing, but it sure does make this fly rugged, is that I'm going to fold over that braid right underneath the eyes where the knot goes, and that way it's kind of tucked away. Nice. And uh, so now we've kind of covered that all up, and uh, that makes this fly pretty much indestructible. You know, when I first started using braided loops, I would not put that knot in there, and then ever, most of the time it would be fine, you know. Uh, but even if you put glue on it, once in a while you'd have a really violent take, and then, then the hook and the <laughs> the fly might still be there, and you're trying to save face when, like a half an hour later, you notice your client's casting a fly without a hook on it. Oh, no. <laughs> like I don't know what happened there. You know? <laughs> must have been that last cast. <laughs> it must yeah. have been. Must have been that rock we had. So, anyways, uh, so this is a a security measure when you're guiding uh, for steelhead swung fly, and Brian knows this too. Is it's a low numbers game, so everything that you do, you want to be as bomb proof as possible because there's nothing worse than working all day to get a bite and then suddenly something mechanical goes wrong with your fly and nobody's happy with that. So, so uh, anyways, I'm gonna I'm gonna just uh, continue with this fly. I've got a olive colored rabbit strip. Uh, pine squirrel would be good too if you want to make it even. Easier to cast, pine squirrel's even thinner and absorbs even less water. But I've been using this as kind of a chunky, chunky fly. I've got about an inch and a half to two inches of rabbit strip here. And I'm just going to lay this right on top, just like so. You don't have to worry too much about the fly being perfectly even with something like this. Just get it on there, lash it in well. And now I'm just going to do some kind of... Uh, woolly bugger type stuff with this fly and I'm going to take an olive schloppen feather 
generally the bigger the better and uh, I'm going to take my fingers and I'm going to stroke this out right where the the fibers of the shop and get a little bit bigger and I'm going to make kind of an X whereas the tip is going this way and the hackles going this way and I'm going to lay it flat on top of the fly so that it's curving downward and I'm just going to wrap that in give it a snip and it's uh, ready for the next step and I'm going to take emu and emu is a really good natural fiber it's unique there's really no other no other type of bird that has a feather quite like this and it works really good for sculpting bodies that you want to kind of maintain their shape uh, and especially if you have flash over it was because it'll keep the fly expanded a little bit and between that and having some uh, schlopping over top of it it really keeps the fly from crushing down and if you're fishing in in current that's a good thing so I tied it in the other feather I tied in by its tip but this feather I tied in by its butt okay right here and I'm going to bring this forward to right behind the eyes now if you have a rotary vise you can certainly use the rotary vise to do what I'm going to do but you just wind this forward with the emu you just kind of watch that it's not getting bound down on itself but whenever you're tying you know I always use one hand to do most of the work that makes your tying a little bit quicker and the other hand just carries a little bit forward just that part that you can't quite get to right behind the eyes I'm going to tie this off like so I'm going to give it a snip and I'm going to take that schloppen feather and I'm going to just like you would with a dry fly you know if you're using a couple hackles with a dry fly how you kind of weave it back and forth this is the exact same thing except kind of jumbo sized and it's a little more forgiving than a dry fly hackle but, but the idea is we're trying not to bind down the uh, emu feather by winding this schloppen feather through it and so when you go back and forth it does that and you can see that we've kind of maintained both feathers going through this like so and I'll give it a little bit more and then I'm just going to tie it off and there we go um, you know sculpins tend to be kind of a yellowish color underneath or kind of a creamy pinkish color um, so I typically use a couple colors to kind of set this fly off um, I use a gold flash like this and then I use a chartreuse colored flash which is kind of a light green and that kind of sets this fly off it seems to be what's working really well this winter so uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a little bit of gold you don't want to use too much this you know I I know what flashy flies are and this this we want to be I feel like we should call attention to Kevin saying you don't want to use too much here <laughs> uh, because I, I, I'm doing a double take <laughs> you won't hear that very often and we'll have a fly later on that's uh, a whole theme park of flash but um, typically with a sculpt and fly I'll try to keep this mostly on the top of the fly like so so I just tied in a few strands and I folded it back and I'm gonna give it a snip and then I'm going to use this lighter green more chartreuse um, I'm not sure I have a use a variety of different brands that works great the hedron um, fire tie works great for this fly uh, and I'm just gonna tie this on top of the fly like so and anything that's left because I'm a pretty cheap guy <laughs> we're gonna try to use it all we don't we don't want any good flash to go to waste, so this is where we're at with this fly. Um, Kevin, you know, what, have, what would you say the length overall is so we're the, at right now? This is going to be about a three and a half inch to four inch fly. It's okay, perfect. Just to get a, bit, a, a little, gauge on that, yeah, yep. some scale for people watching. For what I do swinging these days, that's towards the big end, but I do like this fly a lot of times. You know, I'll, I'll keep one of the clients fishing something big like this while the other one... I have fishing a little more civilized size fly so I often use this this it's called Kraken dubbing it's uh, kind of a mix between a 
um, uh, 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 fibrous dubbing like ice dub and uh, and uh, a lot of um, uh, rubber fibers. So it's a it's a really good thing for a head of a fly because it really keeps the fly from collapsing at the front. So uh, I'm just going to give it a little. In order to make this go all the way around the hook, I'm going to put a clump of it in there and I'm just going to wind it around and then come up the other side, like so. And I'm going to give it a snip. And I'm just going to take my fingers and push it back a little bit. And if I wanted to, I could add even more if I really wanted a bulky fly, but this is about right for what I'm doing. And then just to keep everything moving along, I've got this barred marabou here. Um, this is an olive and brown. If you didn't want have barred marabou, you could use olive or a gray olive marabou would work great for this fly or even a tan. Um, but if you have this, this is a really nice product for sculpins. And all I'm going to do, because I want all these fibers to be even, I'm just going to take them out and I'm going to hold them so that, see how when you hold it level like this they all are the same length below the feather I'm going to pinch it with my finger and just pull it out and you see that keeps all of these about the same length and all I'm going to do you know a lot of people think you know when, when you're using a feather that you want to use always use the full length but you can use marabou to be a short length too and you just simply use half the feather and so I'm just going to get it so that it just covers the head like that. And I'm going to give it a couple turns. And I'm going to leave a little tuft there at the front. And then I'm going to take my thread like so. And I'm going to finish off my fly. It's delicious. Nutritious, delicious. And nutritious. <laughs> Iron supplement. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Yeah. And like uh, then we'd put a hook on the end of it just by making it like so. Now, an interesting thing about this fly is that you can you can tie it so that the hook is free, which is what I do for swinging. But if you wanted to strip this fly, you could certainly pierce it through the rabbit, and it would be pretty versatile. So, I mean, and it's definitely something that the fish will eat. You know, it's something I like having flies like this because I can switch between seasons pretty fluidly. You know, I can switch from swinging flies to steelhead to maybe stripping a fly for trout and still have a use for this fly, whereas I don't have to throw it in a box. And...